Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us here today. Uh, my name is John Greenway. I am the founder and chairman for a group called Mission 2 Alpha. That's mission the number two and then alpha. Uh, we joined forces with the 22 Jumps team here about, I think the first time was about three years ago. Uh, we have about a 15 year history of working with uh, injured military heroes, uh, as well as later on uh, working with first responders. Uh, one of the things that we kind of noticed was we had a lot of people leaving the military and going on to becoming first responders. And some of the injuries and things that they sustained while, while serving the military uh, would not show up lots of times in, until later. And of course that goes <clears throat> not just uh, physical injuries, but that goes along with, with brain injuries and, and other things, as we found out later. Uh, when we were in introduced to the 22 Jumps team and we were introduced to Cohen Veterans Bioscience, uh, all of us on our leadership team were immediately captivated uh, by the incredible work that's being done by this group. Uh, <clears throat> the, the Cohen group are, are making just tremendous strides and, and what they're doing is so incredibly important uh, to not just veterans, but, but really uh, the medical community uh, as a whole. And the more I've gotten to know them, uh, the more I've been involved over the last couple of years, uh, the, the more impressed I am with, with things, uh, the research and all the things that they're accomplishing and in the, in the goal that they're working to or working towards. So I'd like to start today, if we could, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction of everybody that's on the call, and, uh, and then I'll ask you to uh, talk here in just a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> first person we have on the call is uh, Dr. Zervis. Is Zervis correct? Did I that's say correct. that correctly? Yes. All right, awesome. <clears throat> I will just tell you right at first, I'm from Oklahoma. So anything longer than really about one syllable can be a stretch for me. Uh, Dr. Ganunen, uh, Dr. Eric Johnson, uh, Andrew Katz, First Lieutenant, U.S. Army, uh, Nicholas Cliche, hopefully, or Nick, uh, Tech Sergeant, U.S. Air Force. My son is in the Air Force as well. And then Brittany Cantwell, who is a uh, ER nurse and with the Department of Veterans, Veterans Affairs. So to get us started off today, what I'd like to do is, uh, and I believe Tristan, Tristan Wimmer is with us. He just joined this afternoon as well. Uh, welcome, Tristan, good to see you. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll start off this afternoon. I thought it'd be a great way to kind of introduce the call is to learn a little bit more about what uh, Cohen Veterans Bioscience is doing. Uh, Dr. Zervis, uh, if you could, sir, just kind of give us a rundown. And I know you're going to go through some slides and, and kind of give us a better idea of, of where you all are headed, and what the mission looks like and, and what you're doing currently. Sure. So I'm, I'm just going to go through a few slides and, and feel free to stop me at any point if either I'm not clear or if you want something um, explained in a little bit more detail. So I will sh pull up my slides and then share my screen with you. And let me know if you can see my screen. See it. Okay. So I'm um, <clears throat> really excited to be um, with you guys today. And this is really my, you know, being at Cohen Veterans Bioscience was really my first introduction to 22 Jumps. And uh, of course, I deeply appreciate the mission because it dovetails very nicely with what we do at, at CVB. Um, and so as this, my name is Mark Service. I'm the Deputy Director of Translational Research and Development at Cohen Veterans Bioscience. And of course, our overarching mission is to advance brain health. And that's obviously a very broad spectrum. I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of an introduction um, by way of ba my background. And then I'll tell you a little bit about um, the efforts at CVB. So first of all, I've spent time in the military. I was a paratrooper in the military from 83 to 87. Um, actually, it was really one of the instrumental um, events in my life because it really got my interest peaked in science and specifically in brain science. And after I got out of the military, I went to college and then graduated and went off to Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where I earned my PhD in neuroscience. Um, subsequently, I worked as a faculty member at Brown University, and there's a picture shown with one of my graduate students where we worked on neurologic disorders. 
Um, eventually, I moved from Brown University and out of academia into industry where I worked at Amgen. And I specifically spent time overseas in Iceland where I worked with a company called Deco Genetics. And specifically what we did is we used genetics for target identification for neurologic disorders like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then I was presented with a great opportunity at Cohen Veterans Bioscience, which is obviously where I'm at now. And our focus is on military related neurologic disorders, including PTSD and traumatic brain injury or TBI. And so at CVB, of course, we have a, a number of different interests, but they're really focused on fast tracking precision diagnostics and advancing uh, therapeutics. And specifically what that means is identifying ways that we can, we can categorize cohorts of individuals that have been subjected to different types of trauma, whether, which we refer to as invisible wounds, whether that be traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, or also um, issues with suicide ideation. And of course, we have two different fundamental strategic priorities. One of those is to de um, develop accurate, objective, and timely diagnostic tools. And the other is to develop therapeutic approaches. And the objectives to dovetail with these priorities are to evolve from symptom-based to mechanistic approaches. And this may make sense as we move through the talk. And if it doesn't, feel free to interrupt me and ask me about it. And then, of course, we would like to develop the correct background science so that we can catalyze new targeted treatment solutions. And I'm specifically interested in the drug treatment development because of my background. And this really fits well because there's such a need to develop both diagnostic tools and therapeutic approaches for traumatic brain injury and PTSD. And here, I just pulled up a simple example of, of our um, trauma scorecard as we like to refer to it. And it's really striking if you look at the number of approved diagnostics for PTSD, there's nothing. There are few diagnostics for traumatic brain injury. And if you look at the number of approved therapeutics, there's only two therapeutics that have been approved for PTSD, none for traumatic brain injury. And there's really been very little advancement over the last 20 years, meaning there has not been a single new therapeutic um, modality that's been developed for um, either disorder. So that's obviously, I think, alarming from a scientific perspective. And there are some reasons for this lack of progress. Part of it is, as you obviously understand, PTSD and TBI are extremely complex disorders. There's been a lack of investment in understanding the mechanisms of these disorders. That, that really means, you know, what's actually happening in the disorders at the cellular or neural circuit level. And that's really valuable for being able to develop new um, drug treatment strategies and because there's been such a, a lack of understanding of the mechanisms of the diseases, there hasn't been um, new drug targets identified and therefore they've not been advanced. And these two things, um, understanding mechanisms and identifying drug targets are highly interdependent. And then CVB, this is just my own perspective on CVB. CVB sort of has three major pillars, if you will, or arms that interact very closely with each other. We have a translational science team, which is a team that I lead. And we have a clinical science team and a data science team. And the translational science team, what we do is we use our deep expertise in structure and function and understanding of disorders of the brain. And we use that information to help us advanced therapeutic approaches, therapeutic development for CNS disorders. That's specifically what my background has been for the last 20 years. And then we are highly integrated with our clinical science folks and our data science teams. And so with these three arms, what we can then do is carefully reach out to appropriate either academic or industry collaborators and build partnerships that allow us to advance 
solutions in a much more rapid and complete manner compared to the current uh, models that, that exist. Um, and then just you know, to wind my part down in terms of the formal part, um, here's our website. I've also put my contact information there. And of course, any of you are free to reach out to me at, at any point in time, and I'm, I'm happy to chat. Awesome. Thank you for that. Just a, a quick question as a, as a follow-up. Sure. And uh, I know I didn't send this to you in advance, but uh, I'm just curious, what do, you, what do you think the most exciting discovery or maybe most exciting thing going forward that you see happening in, in, in this research process? So uh, one of the most exciting avenues that, that I've seen for PTSD, and I think will be very applicable for traumatic brain injury, is the advances in human genetics. And there was a, a really instrumental paper that came out in 2019 by Nievergelt et al. And that work was, was basically originated and sponsored by CVB. And that led to a much deeper initial understanding of the genetic component of that disorder. And that was really quite interesting because I think many people for quite a while didn't think that genetics would, would play a significant role in these type of complex disorders. Now that we know that, the key thing is how do we build from that information? How do we take that knowledge of fundamental genetics and build from that? And that's really what our mission in the, in the interim is. And I think that this will be a strategy that is, is very applicable to traumatic brain injury as well. Okay. And one other very quick question. Sure. And I had, I had heard uh, some of the other folks at, at CBB talking about this. The fact that brain trauma, PTSD in the past, everybody's been kind of put in the same box and treated the same way. Um, could you could you talk just a little bit to that and why it's important to look at people on a on a case by case basis in, instead of just a category? Sure, I think it, it really speaks to the the complexity of the disorders, and this is where I think genetics has been particularly valuable and will continue to be valuable because what I think that we're likely to find is that there may be either uh, there may be some genetic background that is related to um, certain risk factors. There may be genetic components that allow certain individuals to be responsive to existing therapeutics. For example, the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they're effective in about 50% of the population, but that means there's many people that are not responding to them and there's likely to be a genetic component to that and I think that that will extend well into traumatic brain injury. And obviously traumatic brain injury is a, is a precipitating event from, from a trauma, a physical trauma, but that still doesn't, um, doesn't mean that genetics will not play a component either in terms of either susceptibility or the ability to be responsive to develop therapeutics. That's awesome. That, that's fascinating. I mean, the the whole topic is incredible and and just the amount of research being done and the advancements that you all are making and <clears throat> the fact that you know one of the things we talked about before is your ability to bring in all of these other different groups and and work together seems to me like it's going to really help you to make tremendous strides in, in this area um, we also have with us today uh dr eric johnson uh dr johnson uh it was a retired lieutenant colonel from the u.s army uh, multiple combat deployments, uh, as well as being a, a trauma surgeon for, for special operations. Um, Doctor, I was wondering if you could give us a little bit about your background. Uh, obviously, uh, doing what you've done uh, in a trauma situation especially probably means you've seen many, many different things and, and different types different types of injuries, which would give you, I would think, a pretty unique perspective. So, sir, if you would kind of give us a little bit of information about your background. 
Sure. I, uh, you know, I started in the military right out of high school. Actually, I enlisted. I was kind of at a loss for things to do. And much of my family had been in the military previously. So it seemed like the natural thing to do. Um, you know, served in the combat arms as a medic and then uh, get out and went to school. Ultimately, um, went to medical school on a, on a military scholarship and then came back in the army as an officer, did residency training in the army and, uh, and then separated for a year of fellowship training and then came back. And, uh, you know, that was in the midst of, you know, what they were calling the global war on terror back then, just after 9-11. And, um, you know, so basically for the majority of my career, well, really all of my career as a, as a surgeon, um, you know, we were deploying and, I, you know, all the war fighters are there, the war fighters need general surgeons or trauma surgeons. And I think one of the little known facts, the most deployed entity in the US Army is a 61 Juliet. It's, it's, it's a general surgeon because of the numbers. I mean, there's not many of us. There's a lot of war fighters that need our support. Um, and, and so, you know, it's just a constant merry-go-round of deployment, deployment, deployment. And uh, your dwell time never seemed to be very long. Uh, my initial deployment was was a big army conventional deployment at a combat support hospital that was very, very busy at that time, 2005 in Baghdad. Um, you know, and I saw the, the gamut of, of war trauma. Um, then I ended up kind of getting recruited into, into a, a, a USACOM, you know, unit that uh, supported, you know, kind of high-end special operators, tier one operators, et cetera. Um, and then spent the rest of my time deploying with those guys. Um, you know, that's a whole different ball of wax when you're with them. I mean, the job can be very similar in terms of what we do, um, but it's a whole lot different because it becomes a lot more personal when you're taking care of the guys that you eat chow with and, and you sleep with. and play cards with and, you know, whatnot. And so, you know, it takes on a much more personal um, feel. Uh, and obviously that's harder from a mental standpoint. I think one of the ways we cope as surgeons is we, we try to keep it from being personal. Um, you, you know, you treat it like it's business that you're trying to do your best job of. And, and you know, you, you think about taking care of, of American fighting men and women, and, and that's a personal thing, but you, that's kind of where you try to end it so that it isn't as damaging to you mentally but when it really becomes personal and you're operating on people you consider friends especially if you lose one it's a tough thing um and it, you know, i saw it all I, you know, head trauma and people with tbis uh, and then you kind of you hear about some of the aftermath sometimes you see the aftermath um because it's a small army um and then you know, obviously the mental side of things, I mean, people that came home with PTSD or adjustment disorder or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and that affected us too. Um, and I think, you know, something that gets talked about now more, uh, maybe it's just a new buzz term, but moral injury, you know, I, I think seeing and doing certain things and having to do certain things a certain way and, you know, that maybe you wouldn't do stateside um, and, and obviously result in different outcomes. You know, those things can result in moral injury. And, and so I think everybody comes home with some baggage uh, mentally, uh, whether you recognize it or not, whether you address it or not, you know, whether you deal with it or not, or whether you suffer from it or not. Um, you know, I think the talk that I'm going to give it, the 22 jumps thing is mostly just I guess a gee whiz talk like this is what we did, but I think it gives people, you know, number one, a lot of the people that are there at the event are ex special operators or, you know, spent a bunch of time in the military. So they know from a personal standpoint, but I think for people that didn't do that, it, it's, it's eye opening. It'll be eye opening to some degree to see what we did and what we saw and why we did it and how we did it and all that. Um, you know, my involvement, you know, has started out just to support Tristan and, and, you know, his, cause with his brother but i think you know for all of us veterans i think we're all more than happy to to do anything we can to support fellow veterans and, and further research that'll benefit the folks that are on active duty now and in the future so that's that's my story curious sir um 
when I've met other people in your profession uh, that have dealt with combat trauma. And when they came home, um, <clears throat> I worked a lot with the Marine Raiders, who I'm sure you worked with as well. And one of the things they tell me is that being attached to a mission like this or working with a young man like Tristan, who, is, who has done so much uh, in honor of his brother, that there's a, there's a certain part of that that is also therapy for you and what, what, you've, what you've experienced in the past. Um, would you mind touching on that or? or, if, or... No, I, you're 100% right. I, it is therapeutic. And so, I, you know, I certainly have my own demons that I live with uh, and that I'll be honest, they affect me at work and the way I do things. I mean, I work at the Cleveland Clinic and I'm training people and I'm taking care of really complicated stuff that really has nothing to do with, with war trauma. Um, but, it, you know, the way I deal with things and the way I see things and the things that frustrate me, I think are very heavily influenced by what I experienced and you know, doing something like this and working with a group like this is therapeutic. And, you know, for me, one of the biggest things is just being around like-minded people. I can, you know, I can go to the Parian Bridge and I can hang out with Tristan and, and all the other guys. And I just, I, I sort of relax and just get into the zone, totally in the now. And I can, I feel good. And, and that is therapeutic, just hanging out, with people that, that have been through this stuff because they get it. And we don't even have to be talking about 22 jumps or the war or anything. It's everything. We all just sort of get it the same way. And that's therapeutic. And, and right. you, know, you don't want to blame other people for not being able to get you. Uh, but you know, the fact of the matter is, is, is it's tough to sit around folks that haven't been through what we've been through. And it, it's just harder to relate to them on the same level. I think we all have a problem. Makes sense. There's a there's a brotherhood uh, that exists. I'm I'm a civilian, lifelong civilian, and when I'm around it, I I I have seen guys that have had tremendous difficulties. And when when placed in an environment with other people that understand them, uh, that brotherhood comes to the surface pretty quickly, and uh, re really can make a difference. Well, uh, as a civilian, sir, I appreciate your service and um, everything, everything that you've done. And uh, we really, we really do. And uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, when we go to Twin Falls. Um, <clears throat> next on the list, um, and excuse me, sir, if I, if I mispronounce this, uh, Dr. Ganoon. Um, <clears throat> welcome, uh, welcome to the call, sir. And uh, I understand that uh, you also have a son that is uh, involved with the mission as well. If you could give us a little bit about your background and uh, tell us why you've decided to kind of join the mission. First of all, I really want to thank you for inviting me to this. And yes, Adam is my son and he's friend with Tristan and he reached out to me. He said, dad, I, uh, we are doing this. We need your support. I say, Adam, sure. And we talked to Tristan and it was really great, great pleasure. As you can see from my accent, I am Lebanese originally, but how I came to the US is interesting. Uh, I was a professor at Kuwait University uh, till the invasion of Kuwait, where I was on holiday in uh, England during the August of that year when they moved on and uh, really lost everything overnight. Okay, maybe when I go to uh, Twins Falls, I will tell you the details of that, but I can tell you I then came to the US with the help of my, my story was in the Washington Post with the help of a uh, kind African-American person, I went to him, I said, listen, I was invited to give a talk uh, here at uh, uh, DC and I want to stay because the National Institute of Health uh, Director of Infectious Diseases uh, wants me to come in two weeks back because there are people who are in fungal infection. I work with fungus, so they will be here in DC. It would be great if you meet them. And I, so, I said to uh, Dr. Jack Bennett, you know, I told him, hey, listen, Jack, I can't uh, stay. I have no money. So going to my hotel uh, and uh, I saw, uh, you know, in the Meridian Hotel, there was a travel agent and with the black uh, African-American. I went to him. I said, listen, you have to help me. You are a black guy. You, you understand difficulties. You have to help me, you know. And guess what? 
He said, what do you want? He looked at me. I don't know if I will do it now, <laughs> but that was desperate. Yeah. So I said, listen, I wanted to change my ticket because I need to come back here because I have opportunity to get a job. And to cut long story short, he really was a kind man. He changed my ticket. He gave me some money. And I came to DC and Dr. Jack Bennett invited all these principal investigators, like really the PIs of uh, fungal infections to his house and he invited me as well and guess what I got two jobs that evening <laughs> and uh, you know this is all because of the really uh, tremendous love we got since we came to the U.S. you know and and really like to me as somebody who was an immigrant I tell you all the time I talk, I tell pe to people, you don't understand about America. America have great people. America can help you and support you. And really, me and my children, I have three kids, about uh, Adam and Afif and Emma, and they are part of the society and we really integrated. And I tell you, when Adam told me, we are, uh, I, I want me, I wanted to be involved. And of course, Eric knows uh, Adam as well. I, it, it meant a lot to me that I will be able to contribute to how you, uh, the American people and what happened in Kuwait, I was helped. And because of this, I, I'm so excited about doing that. Now, one thing I bring into the table with respect to uh, depression and, uh, you know, I work in an area called the microbiome, which is really microorganisms that, that live in our body. And when COVID hit, I start looking into it and guess what? There is a great really relationship between depression and the germs that live in our gut, okay? Because of the gut brain access, you see that it affects them. And therefore, when you have imbalance in your gut, you will start to have really issues, anxiety, depression, stress, as apart from any uh, other uh, other diseases. And with that in mind, I went deep and I wrote a, an article uh, to describe the relationship between depression and the microbiome. And then what we can do about balancing that. And I published this paper and I really, when Adam told me about, you know, uh, uh, 22 jumps and the uh, focus on brain and issues and PTSD, uh, I said, this will be very, very relevant because I hope we can contribute in a way to try to help them by doing things which not necessarily medications, uh, lifestyle, diet, but also we are working. I started a company with my eldest son uh, called Biome, B-I-O-H-M. And we are looking at sub data from people who are depressed and then trying to see what can we do to rebalance the microbiome to help them. So it's not a drug like Dr. Uh, Zerva said, it is a more uh, nutritional supplement. So I hope to share some of this information and I really hope it will help. I will want to close this, it will be great if we can also talk together to see how we can do a study in, uh, in, in uh, veterans who have, have PTSD so that we can characterize the microbiome and maybe we can make it more personal uh, regarding how to adjust this uh, imbalance. That's awesome. That's great. Well, <clears throat> we're certainly glad you're here and uh, glad that you're a part of it. Um, <clears throat> I don't know even speaking for myself, but this isn't exactly what you're talking about, but I made a lifestyle change a few years ago and um, I was about 52 pounds heavier than I am now. And by, <clears throat> you were talking about diet and about changing your lifestyle. It made an incredible impact on me, not just physically, but, but mentally as well. Just changing my diet, exercising, <clears throat> working out, those, those types of things uh, had, a, had a tremendous physical and mental, mental impact. So uh, I really look forward to speaking with you more about that. And uh, we're excited about seeing you in, uh, in Twin Falls as well, sir. Thank you very Thank much. You. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. So uh, next, next on the agenda, uh, we have Nick. Uh, Nick is a tech sergeant uh, with the United States Air Force. Uh, Nick is one of the guys that will be doing the jump 22 times uh, in Twin Falls. 
for those of you that have not seen Prime Bridge, uh, I've seen it up close. Uh, Tristan tricked me into getting thrown off that bridge uh, last year. Uh, <clears throat> it's not the jump that is the big deal, really. It's the fact that these guys jump, get to the bottom, and they have to hike back up out of this canyon 22 times in a single day. And having watched that last year, uh, it's, it's really one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. It's, it's incredibly impressive. Uh, Nick, I wonder if you could uh, talk to us a little bit about your involvement in the mission, uh, why you're doing it, uh, and what it means to you. I think you may be muted. Yeah, there we go. I got it. I got it working. Um, yeah, I got involved last year. Uh, a friend of mine, his daughter was uh, working with Tristan in the 22 jumps, and I reached out and asked how I can get involved, and he forwarded me Tristan's information, and Tristan said that I'm more than welcome to show up and, and do some packing, and uh, I kind of put a little bug in his ear um, when I first met him, and it was like, hey, I'd love to do these jumps. You know, I think it'd be really cool, and uh he, he kept that in mind, you know, that stuck with him and he reached out to me and asked if I wanted to get involved. And I said, absolutely. Um, you know, the 22 jumps itself, uh, you know, it represents the 22 veterans that take their lives, you know, on average every single day. And you see people, you know, doing the 22 push ups a day or 22 pull ups a day, you know, to gain attention. And when I saw that Tristan was using base jumping in that similar aspect, um, I thought it was just incredible. Um, I have a non-combat related job, but I work with pilots every day, uh, fighter pilots. And I know some of them struggle uh, with PTSD based off of some of the experiences that they have had. And uh, my, my ex-wife and the, you know, the mother of my daughter, she struggles with PTSD and mental illness as well. And so watching her struggle, um, watching some of my pilots struggle, you know, it's something that hits home for me. Um, and it's something that if I can, even put a drop in the bucket, you know, uh, to assist with these, this issue, then I'm going to be all for it. And the 22 jumps project does way more than just a simple drop in the bucket. They are incredible. And in the, the amount of money and attention that they've been able to, uh, to give, you know, the crisis that's going on right now. Well, that's, that's great. Um, you know, I, I know from personal experience, having no pilots and, you know, those guys are always expected to be, you know, just ironclad all the time, you know, always squared away. And, and they, they have to go through a lot of, a lot of experiences as well. And, you know, our, our experience was that those guys in that particular profession sometimes are not as willing to talk about it uh, as others because they don't want to lose time in the chair. Uh, they don't want to lose flight time. And, and so I certainly understand what you're saying. And, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you. Uh, we're going to have a great time. Uh, it means a lot when somebody in your position also as busy as you are, uh, being a father, obviously, and being in the military, and the fact that you're willing to give back like this and take this kind of time says says a lot about you. We, we truly appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, so next, another one of our uh, guys that's going to be jumping this year is, is Andrew Katz. Uh, Andrew, why don't you uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, about 22 jumps and why why you made the decision to be involved as well? Thank you, hey everyone. I'm Andrew. Um, I like Nick. I had heard about the event. I'd read about it, seen some videos, um, and the thing that jumped out of me at first was just the sheer feat of accomplishment, the the hiking aspect of it, but also. Jumping, but jumping safely. Uh, base jumping is is a very, it's a very dangerous activity, but it's also an activity that, when done right, it it brings a sense of accomplishment, a sense of of happiness and purpose to to so many that I've met in the sport, um, and especially out at the Prime Bridge, which is kind of the heart of base jumping, especially in the United States. Um, I was I was introduced to Tristan from a buddy Kevin um, who had jumped with previously. And I didn't even realize that, that the opportunity would, would ever exist to be a part of something like this. So it's a, it's a huge honor um, that Tristan uh, accepted me onto the team. And, and uh, I really cannot wait to, to see everyone out there next weekend or in two weekends um, in Idaho. But um, 
yeah, just a, a little bit of, about myself and, and, and why I'm, I'm so honored to be a part of this. Um, I am currently serving in a, in a non-combat related role. I'm an infantry officer um, in the army. We were, I was stationed in Savannah and we were set to deploy in 2019. And unfortunately that deployment was canceled about a month out in uh, one of the previous presidential administration's drawdowns. That kind of opened the door to come to Washington DC um, and pursue an opportunity that not, not something that's advertised, um, especially to, to infantry lieutenants. Um, but just by luck of the draw and, and you know, persistence, I ended up taking command of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington National Cemetery, um, where I'm currently finishing up right now. Um, and mental health became very real to me very quickly. Um, we operate under an invisible pressure that emerged in 1921, over 100 years ago, when our nation laid the first unknown soldier to rest uh, from World War I. And since that time, in, over the past century, a hundred years of tradition of reverence and honor has grown out of that tomb as we've laid to rest uh, three other unknown soldiers representing World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam War, um, and then the installment of guards. It was a few years later in 1925 that the first guard was installed. Um, and the tradition of that guard has grown and the standard of excellence and perfection has only grown um, as every day we attempt to honor the sacrifices of those who've come before us, those who've given their life fighting for our country and specifically those who've given their identity, uh, those whom we were not able to thank as a nation. That's kind of the, the burden that, that we bear. And that's really what drives um, the pursuit of perfection and and sometimes to dangerous levels and uh and I, and I witnessed it firsthand pretty much right off the bat um it's a small team that performs this mission 24 7 365 days a year um and things like sleep and health and diet and and you know r and r and family time unfortunately some sometimes those things fall by the wayside um to to ensure continuity of the mission and you know being being in command that that pretty much meant uh, you know i'm on all the time um and it does it does wear on you for from time to time and um you know starting to recognize starting to be able to recognize those signs of deteriorating mental health is is something that i will really take away from this position and something that really makes me fired up and honored to be a part of uh, 22 jumps this year just knowing what the effects of of mental health and also um, TBI and combat related injuries can do to someone, to a family, to a community, it's uh, it's severe. So it's a, it's a huge honor. I know, um, you know, this is going to be an incredible event. Tristan, can't thank you enough for for leading this effort and continuing this tradition. You know, in honor of your brother and and the so many um, who who fought for this country. So. Once again, um, I'm Andrew and, and really excited to meet everybody and excited to get jumping. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, for being here and for what you do. Um, I was in DC a few years ago when they had a really nasty blizzard. And I had read at the time that, um, and, I'm, and forgive me if I use an inappropriate term here, but um, I was told that um, <clears throat> the guards at the, at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier were told that they could stand down because of the blizzard and they refused and i saw a picture which had an incredible impact on me because all you could see was just the outline of this of this guard who chose even in the worst weather to still protect and 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 to serve that incredible monument and uh i think just that picture alone tells the story of uh of the honor that's shown every day by by your group so um we we thank you for your service sir i appreciate it um <clears throat> we'll kind of finish the call out today uh if if everybody's good with it uh by talking to a young man who has really inspired this entire effort uh i had the honor of, of meeting him i think maybe three years ago uh could even be four now um and upon meeting him i i knew immediately that there was something very special about him uh, not only was he passionate about his cause, but he was also committed 
and and he was willing to execute uh, even with all the the personal costs that were involved and we've had conversations about that before and when you when you lead a group like 22 jumps or Cohen veterans bioscience or mission 2 alpha there's there's personal sacrifices that come along with that but in Tristan's case and in the cases of many others and, and the people that are on this call, his, his commitment to this mission, he allowed to supersede a lot of other things in his, in his personal and professional life. And, and I've, uh, I've watched him over the last three years and what he's been able to do. And uh, it's incredibly impressive. So uh, Tristan, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about 22 Jumps, your background, why this is important and, and what we'll be doing on Memorial Day. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Jonathan. It's, uh, it's, it's quite the introduction. I, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, um, yeah, so my name is Tristan Wimmer. I'm the, I'm the founder and CEO of 22 Jumps. Uh, so 22 Jumps was was started in January of, of 2020, um, and it, it started as a as a as a kind of a one event thing, just to to use base jumping as a way to to honor my brother, my my brother. Uh, my brother and I served in the Marine Corps together. I was a second battalion first Marines. He was in first recon, and then and then he went on to, to go to first Marsoc. Um, he he sort of inspired me to get into base jumping, um, and I so I, I kind of followed him into base jumping to to create a pathway to to, to grow closer to him after after the Marine Corps, um, and then uh, you know so that that. Not only not only has the Marine Corps and then my relationship with my brother, but base jumping has also had like an enormous impact uh, just in general on, on my life. So, uh, it seemed like an appropriate way to honor him. So that that was that was the impetus behind 22 jumps. Um, you know, my brother ended up taking his own life in 2015. Uh, he, he suffered a, a massive traumatic brain injury in Iraq in 2006. Um, struggled, uh, deteriorated is probably the better word uh, uh, for for about nine years until he uh, ended up taking his own life. So. Uh, that had a uh, profound effect on me. I was actually on contracts. Uh, I was in security contracting in Afghanistan, basically living in Afghanistan full time for like four years. Uh, when I got the call, um, was devastated. Uh, took me to me full to 24 months to get my feet underneath me to feel like I, I was no longer in in emotional, mental health free fall. Um, and once once I was able to sort of get back on my own two feet, I was looking for a way to to, to honor him, and and that's where 22 jumps came about. So. Um, like I said, it wasn't, it, it never wasn't, I never intended it to, to become what it is today and, and sort of what it's becoming down the road. It, it's, it's sort of impressive. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it would not be possible without the love and support and the effort and the time uh, that, that other people who sort of recognize the, the sincerity in it and who recognize the, um, you know, what I'm doing is, is, is unique and, 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 you know, what I would, you know, people agree with with my view and seeing it as important. Um, and, you know, people just continue to sort of <laughs> pop out of the woodwork to be a part of it, which is like, incredibly humbling and, and, um, and incredibly, you know, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's just incredible to, to, to to create a thing that, and, you know, that everybody wants to be a part of uh, and, and contribute to. So I uh, thank you all for, for, for being a part of that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so you know, I was I was a Marine. Uh, I was uh, I was in the Marine Corps as an infantryman as a Scott sniper, um, deployed you know, high deployment tempo or early 2000s, um, and um, got out, went to school, uh, got in contracting, worked for the Department of State for about four years doing security contracting in Afghanistan. And, um, yeah, and then that that led me to to graduate school and then 22 jumps, and and so that's that's what leads me to to here. So. And uh, don't you have some uh, big news coming up here? Yeah. I do. Uh, you don't see it, but just off camera, this room is full of baby stuff. So I have uh, <laughs> uh, my my firstborn is actually due the the day of the event. So great. <laughs> so I actually this, this will be the first this will be the first event that I, I neither or my neither either myself or my wife won't be in there in person. So it's a big it's a big growth moment. Um, sort of like not just uh, being helped by other people, but actually handing it off to 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 those who who will sort of see it through, uh, you know, on 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 event day. So that's a big growth opportunity for us. So we're excited for it. 
uh, we're excited as well. It's going to be going to be a great event, and um, yeah. and both events are going to be great. Yeah. Uh, although your wife, she may not agree with part of that deal, but uh, but it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be going to be very exciting. Um, tell us how uh, people can find the website. How do they find information on Twenty Two Jumps? Yeah, so Twenty Two Jumps, it's it's on all social platforms. So Twenty Two Jumps dot org is the website, um, and then on on all the social platforms, it's pretty much Twenty Two Jumps, with the exception of Instagram. It's, it's Twenty Two Jumps Project. Okay, <clears throat> great. Well, we appreciate everything you've done, Tristan. Uh, it's been absolute honor uh, working with you, your team, uh, your wife, and and all the people at, at Cohen Veterans Bioscience. So we'll close with this. The 22 Jumps event will happen on Memorial Day weekend in Twin Falls, Idaho. Um, <clears throat> I will not be jumping this year, as far as I know, unless somebody is able to talk me into it. Uh, but we have somebody with Mission 2 Alpha who's, who's decided to join the team. Uh, his name is David Schaefer. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to see information on him as well. So we're looking forward, to, looking forward to a great event. I would encourage anybody that sees this Go on to Cohen Veterans Bioscience website, look at the exciting things that they're doing, join the team, get involved in the mission, and you're going to help change lives on, on down the road. And what could what could ever be, be better than that? So thank you very much. God bless, and we'll see you soon.